God, the battle belongs to you because you have already been victorious over the powers of darkness and evil in this world. And Lord, as we come to you, we confess that there are places where we are full of anxiety, fears about the future, concerns about what might happen. And so, Lord, I pray for a spirit of surrender as you work in us. And Lord, that you would strengthen us in our faith and our trust in what you have in store. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Um, we're going to start praying some, a little more uh, in just a moment. And if you're taking notes, you've got the bulletin that you're, that you're taking notes, you're going to notice that I'm, I picked for our prayer focus for a dynamic movement of God in our denomination and in the, in the Evangelical Congregational Church. And the reason for that is that what's called the prayer mobilization team um, that's part of our denomination put together a prayer guide. We're going to be kind of using pieces of it here and there. But what I want to read for you this morning, I didn't do this at 8 o'clock, so don't tell them I'm doing it now, okay? But uh, I want to read for you the vision statement that's been adopted by our denomination a few years back. And we're going to be hearing more and more about this as we go through this year and the years ahead. This is the vision statement for the Evangelical Congregational Church. It says, The Evangelical Congregational Church will be a dynamic movement of God led by pastors and laity who have a burning passion for God and a missionary zeal to reach the lost. We will creatively obey the Great Commission by transforming plateaued and declining churches into healthy disciple-making churches that are committed to evangelizing the communities to which God has called them. Healthy churches will reproduce themselves by planting churches in least-reached communities. Interdependence will be a distinguishing mark of the Evangelical Congregational Church as local churches network with one another and ministries beyond the EC family to proclaim the gospel to the world. That's what we're called to do as part of our denomination. And so that's what we're going to pray about. That's why we're calling it, it's being called a dynamic movement of God. This is not just you know, church as normal. This is not just kind of hang on for those churches that are really struggling for as long as possible. This is actually claiming new territory in, for the kingdom of God. And so that's what we're going to pray about this morning. Uh, we'll be praying about similar things and kind of working that into stuff over the, like I said, over the next couple of months. So want to encourage you to uh, participate. I'll be sharing that too uh, with you in detail. But we'll spend some time in silent prayer, and then I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer that our denomination, the Evangelical Congregational Church, would become truly a dynamic movement of God. And then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer like we always do. We'll put the words on the screen in back of me, and you are invited to pray the Lord's Prayer out loud so that you can hear the sound of your own voice. Let's pray together. Lord God, we are grateful for the, the privilege we have to be part of the body of Christ as a whole and to come before you in worship this morning. And Lord, as we reflect for a, just a few moments on the leadership that God has raised up in our denomination, we're grateful for Bishop Randy and his ministry, uh, his vision for what it is you've got for us as a denomination. And so, Lord, we pray that uh, you would energized by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, congregations in our community to rise up, to be, uh, to be encouraged, and that we would become genuinely a dynamic movement of the Most High God. And so, Lord, I ask that you would work in our midst and do something God-sized as people come to faith in Christ, that we ask for the privilege to help them to grow in sanctification and knowledge of the, the truth of your Word, and to baptize them, and to Lord, to, to see a, a, a swelling, a, a population of heaven as people come to faith in Christ, as they repent of their sins and turn to Christ for salvation. And so, Lord, in it all, we ask you to glorify yourself. Make yourself known in new and fresh ways. 
and use us in your mission in our community. We pray all this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we're working our way through our series on Peter, and uh, I actually mapped it out for the rest of the year. It's going to work out just about perfectly if all goes well, uh, that uh, when we get up to the beginning of Advent in December, uh, we'll finally finish this series. But God's been doing some amazing things in Peter's life, hasn't he? And so um, I'm, I've told you over the last couple of weeks, we, we've seen sort of a, a three-step process of where Peter's life is being completely transformed. And he went from that guy who denied Jesus three times, who, uh, who Jesus uh, told, get behind me, Satan, and the guy who was just kind of impulsive and kind of all over the place. And so as we're going to see today, this is sort of the, the final step of his transformation as he becomes the guy who actually had been called by Christ to come follow him for a purpose, not just to hang out, not just to grow in his own knowledge and just think that was a lot of fun, wasn't it? But really to, be, to serve a purpose, to have a role in God's kingdom. And so what we're going to look at today is uh, the coming of God the Holy Spirit as you could probably tell by the slide up on the screen. Uh, but we want to look at uh, today, we're going to go back a chapter in John's Gospel to John chapter 20, verse 19 through 23. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive sins, the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. May God grant us this day an understanding of this, His holy word. Amen. We're going to be a little bit ambitious this morning uh, and look at three kind of big chunks of Scripture as things come together. If everything works out well, we'll kind of see how those three things connect uh, before we get to the end of the message. I'm not going to make any promises, okay? But uh, I will do my best to connect the dots for us as we take a look at it. Now, this is one of the reasons I ask you guys to bring your Bible, because we're going to be turning some pages this morning. But our big idea for today is that when Peter received the Holy Spirit, his life, faith, and ministry were transformed, and he stepped into the role for which Jesus had called him. That's, that's what we're going to see as we get through these three points. Now, you remember that Peter had been a witness to the resurrected Christ. You, you remember that, that uh, when uh, the resurrection happened, uh, the, the angel said to the ladies who came, had come to the tomb, hey, go tell the disciples and make sure you tell Peter, because it, it's really important that he be included, because he had denied Jesus three times. And last week, we saw that Jesus asked the question three times to, of Peter, do you, do you really love me? and had restored him in a way. And this is sort of the completion of that whole restoration process after Peter had messed up big time. And so um, what we're going to see is, is how Jesus, as I just read, breathes the Holy Spirit into his disciples. And among them, of course, is Peter. And so the first point that we're going to look at in our outline is that these guys are being equipped for ministry. And so there's a real, a real purpose that that's happening here. So we're going to take a look at, at uh, verse, uh, let's see, I'm going to go back to, we'll start at verse 19. And so it says, when it was evening on that day, and so it says it was the first day of the week. So this is the, the Sunday of the resurrection. And that evening, it says, uh, when the doors were shut, and the disciples were where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. And so don't forget, this is sort of a chaotic scene that, that Jesus 
has been crucified on Friday. He's resurrected, and they can't really quite figure out what's going on. There's certainly, there, there's uh, a lot of tumult, a lot of excitement going on in Jerusalem where they're hanging out. And so they, they shut themselves into uh, their, the, a room so that the, the Jews wouldn't come get them, right? And so it's a little bit like what happened to a lot of us over the last few weeks when the escaped murderer was running around in Chester County, and a lot of people suddenly were locking their doors at night and, and behaving a little bit differently and leaving their lights on and that kind of stuff. Because, hey, man, we want to make sure they don't come get us, right? And so the, the, uh, the disciples are saying, hey, we, let's, let's just make sure we stay safe. So they lock the doors, and Jesus shows up in the middle of the room. That's going to freak you out a little bit, isn't it? Right? And so, and don't forget that he wasn't just spiritually resurrected, like a Jehovah's Witness might say. He's physically resurrected. Because last week we talked about he's eating breakfast, right? Ghosts don't eat breakfast, right? And so, so he's physically resurrected, but he's still God. And so he's able to pass through into the room. That's going to get your attention. It's in a little bit. And I think they, they were like, their reaction had to be one of, what in the you fill in the blank kind of, right? And so but I think that's why the Jesus right away goes, peace be with you. It, like, it, it's okay. Peace be with you. In verse 20, it says, that when he said this, he showed them both his hands and his sides. And so he, he's kind of revealing, yeah, it, it's really me. Right? He shows them his hands and, and, and his side. And, and when they saw this. It says they, they rejoiced when they saw it. Like, it's really him. He's really back. Praise the Lord. Now, unfortunately, if you read a few more verses into this chapter, which I would encourage you to do during the course of the week if you haven't looked at it recently, one of the guys apparently was still waiting. It, if, it's Sunday, so it wasn't Chick-fil-A, but he was still waiting to pick up dinner for everybody else. They sent old Thomas out to pick up dinner, and, and he wasn't there. Can you imagine? Thomas comes back into the room, and they're like, Thomas, you're never going to believe this. Jesus was here, and he just walked through the wall or through the door, and, and, and he showed us his signs, and I'm like, come on, man. And so Jesus has to come back again. Hey, Thomas, I know you were out, but just so you know, yeah, it really was me. He shows them his, the holes in his hands and his side also. And they rejoiced, it says. And so in verse 21, it says, So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And that's a really, really important statement. Because don't think about, or don't forget where, where we are in, in the context of things. We're getting to the point where Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. And, and they're going to have to actually assume the responsibility that Jesus has been teaching them about for the last three years. He's been telling them, hey, guess what? You're going to have to be ready. And, and that's why this transformation is not yet quite complete in Peter's life or in the other disciples' lives because they're not fully equipped. They've got a lot of head knowledge. And, and they've witnessed some pretty amazing things, right? Jesus healing leopards. And leopards. I always said, did I say leopards? Well, it's a cat, so I don't know. But anyway... <laughs> This never happens at 8 o'clock, I'm just telling you. <laughs> and I you know it's not October yet, but anyway. Um, lepers, the people that have leprosy, right? Jesus heals. He, he brings dead people back to life. He, I mean, he gives sight to blind. And not only just to, not just to restore sight to blind people, but he gives sight to people that had never even seen before, been born blind. And he did some pretty, and Peter and the, and the other disciples have seen all of this stuff. I mean, you think, I to think, man, we, we're, we're on board. We got this. But Jesus goes, you're not quite ready to do what I've called you to do. There's one thing that you still need, and that is going to be God the Holy Spirit. And so he breathes into them God the Holy Spirit. Like just, like literally breathe, like the breath. That's, I mean, receive the Holy Spirit, he says. Because he says, as, as God has sent me, as the Father has sent me, I'm, I'm sending you. And you're going to need 
God the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see the difference that that makes in their lives as we go. But to actually breathe into them, like physically, literally breathe into them. Sometimes we, we kind of get confused about what's supposed to be literal and what's supposed to be figurative in Scripture. But literally, he's breathing on them, and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And it reminds me, I don't know if it reminds you, but it reminds me of all the way back in Genesis chapter 2, when the first man is formed out of the dust of the earth, and his name was what church? Adam. As, as, but Adam, Adam is formed. Not, not created ex nihilo, out of nothing, like everything else of creation, but he is actually formed out of something pre-existing, the dust of the earth. And like I tell you, every time I read that, I, I can't help but think about, about our Lord getting down on his knees in the dust and forming our body. And in chapter uh, 2 of, of Genesis, verse 7, it says, The Lord formed man of the dust of the earth, formed, not created, but formed. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. The inanimate dust of the earth became animated, became alive by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, by the breath of God. And so here the disciples are being breathed on in a way that they receive God, the Holy Spirit, in, in a whole new way, in a way that they couldn't have possibly understood. If you go back to the, to the Old Testament, for example, we see God, the Holy Spirit, like comes, and, and, and uh, by the way, God, the Holy Spirit is a He. We talked about this at our, minist- at our uh, membership retreat yesterday at some length. Uh, God, the Holy Spirit, is not an it. He is the He. He's the third person of the Trinity. And that's why I'm usually, not always, but usually careful to refer to the Trinity as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Not an easy concept for us to understand. But we see God the Holy Spirit present back in Genesis chapter 1 when it says the Spirit of God hovered over the deep. God the Holy Spirit present at the very beginning of the Bible. But they receive the disciples receive a new life in a way. And so they're, they're called into ministry because they're, they're going to need that kind of authority to minister in a way that they never had because Jesus has been there to help them out and in some ways to defend them and to instruct them and to rebuke them and correct them and to give them step by step, here's what you need to do kind of instructions. And he's about to leave and leave behind God the Holy Spirit. But there's the next couple of verses, or the next verse, excuse me, I want, to, I want to be a little bit careful about make sure we understand it, because he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 23, it says, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. And there's a little bit of confusion about that verse, and I want to see if we can't come to an understanding about what Jesus is actually telling them. Because if I were a Roman Catholic, you know, they believe in what's called apostolic succession, that all the priests that are currently ministering in churches, wherever they might be, are in, in the line of Peter and the, disciples, the apostles. That's what apostolic success, succession means. They say, hey, pastor, you're not, because you're not a Catholic. Nothing sorry for a different time, but... But what they say is, what you, what you need to do, if you want to have your sins forgiven, you need to come to us and, and confess your sins to a priest, right? You guys are familiar with that concept. I'm sure most of you, at least on TV or a movie or someplace, maybe you've experienced it personally. And so we don't do that because the Bible tells us that there is one intermediary between God and man, and that's the man, Jesus Christ. We go directly to God to ask for forgiveness. He is the only one technically who can forgive sins. And if the apostles receive that as a literal instruction for them to do, there is no record of that anywhere in the New Testament. They never once forgive anybody's sins. They never once say, hey, come confess to us, and so we'll take care of it. But they continually, repeatedly, and always point to Jesus. But there's kind of an interesting principle, I think, particularly if we look at our guy Peter, 
Because Peter, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, goes to Jesus. He says, he came to him and said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my, my brother who sins against me? How often do I have to forgive him? And, and he says, as many as seven times? Do I have to forgive him seven times? Then what's Jesus' answer? Anybody know? Seventy times seven. So some of you say, well, you math whizzes are like, well, that's 490 times. It doesn't count that you get to 490 times. Some of you married couples have been asking for forgiveness, and you're like, well, you're only up to 364, so keep going, buddy. <laughs> but see, I don't think that that's what Jesus is saying. He says you need to continually ask for forgiveness. We need to be people of forgiveness. And so when Peter, notice, notice what Peter's question is. When he says, my brother sins against me, you, you catch a, a subtlety there? When he sins against me, how often do I have to forgive him? And Jesus instructs him, you need to be a person of forgiveness. Because he even tells us that if you don't forgive your brother, you don't forgive other people, don't expect that God's going to forgive you. That's the way that we're supposed to walk through life. We're supposed to have that spirit of forgiveness. But then if I go to, to, to Psalm 51, we're not going to put it up, but in Psalm 51 is, is David's psalm of repentance. And in and, and David's psalm of repentance, you guys are familiar with David's story, right? And he committed adultery with Bathsheba and had Uriah, her husband, killed. And he, he messed up. Some people suggest that he broke every one of the Ten Commandments all in, in one weekend. But in Psalm 51, when David repents... He says to God, it is against you only I have sinned. And he goes to God for, give, for forgiveness. And so there's a biblical principle that if we offend somebody else, we hurt somebody else, then we ought to ask them to forgive us. Or if somebody has, you know, we, we're supposed to forgive one another for the offenses that we cause. And honestly, if I've, if I've offended anybody that's here this morning or watching online, and I'm quite certain that I have, then I seek your forgiveness. When I offend God, when I sin against God, I seek His forgiveness directly. And so that seems to be the biblical principle, that when we sin against God, the Most High God, it is His forgiveness that we ought to seek. And we see that played out biblically and, and scripturally. But they always point back to Jesus. You know, in, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, right, the wages of sin is death, right? But the free gift of God is what? Eternal life in Christ Jesus, right? And so it's always through Christ Jesus that we receive our forgiveness. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, this is what Paul writes to the church. He says, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness. Who is it that rescued us from the domain of darkness, church? Jesus is the one that rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It is only through Jesus Christ that our sins can be forgiven. Amen? Amen. Thank you. It's only Jesus. Now, some of you are probably thinking, now, this is a little odd based on what I know about the New Testament, right? And so how the church got started. There's a day that uh, we point to when God the Holy Spirit comes. Who remembers what that's called? Pentecost, Pentecost right? Which is not technically a Christian holiday. It's actually a Jewish holiday. It just happened that God the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, Pentecost literally just means 50, so it's 50 days after the first day of Passover, and so that's why it's a Jewish holiday. But we celebrate it because God the Holy Spirit comes. But here's Jesus breathing the Holy Spirit into his disciples. Why in the world would he do that? Why, could, why didn't he just wait a few weeks until Pentecost comes? And I, and I this is not necessarily biblical, but I, I, I think it's probably pretty accurate. And so I'm going to show you a picture of the space shuttle. Where are we going now, Pastor? Right? Um, you guys remember the space shuttle, right? Um, and so who knows what that big orange thing is in the front of the space shuttle? That's the fuel tank. <laughs> 
You guys remember when they used to paint the fuel tank white? The first few uh, space shuttle missions, they painted it white. And somebody figured out how many thousands of pounds of extra weight the paint added. And they go like, let's just leave it primer. And that's why it's red. It's not white like the rest of the stuff is there. And so that fuel tank provides the energy through the rockets that they need to get off the planet. And you guys are really good at physics. Eight o'clock nailed this one. So I, I appreciate all the physics majors here this morning. But there's a physics uh, principle that an object at rest tends to stay at rest. Very good. I, knew, I, I had absolute confidence in you that you're going to get that one right. So, yeah, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. An object at rest tends to stay at rest, a basic principle of physics. And so that's true of a rocket. It, it takes more energy in the first minute or two to get moving than it takes the entire rest of its mission. And so I want to make sure I get this right. That, that tank, that fuel tank holds 1.7 million pounds of liquid fuel. And when it first ignites, it's burning at a rate of 11,000 pounds per second. And so that's going to upset a few people because that gets a whole lot worse mileage than your truck does, Pastor. Amen? <laughs> right? And so, but 11,000 pounds per second in less than eight minutes, the entire thing is empty because it takes so much energy to get it moving. And then once it's moving, it takes less and less energy to keep it going. In fact, after it, it gets uh, beyond the gravitational pull of the planet, when it gets into space, it takes about a bucket worth of fuel for the entire rest of its mission. But it takes all of that just to get it moving. I think at the, at the beginning of the church, which is what we're talking about here, when Jesus is getting ready to ascend into heaven, and he looks at his apostles, he goes, you guys need a boost. Because it's going to take some energy to get this thing moving. Amen? And so he breathed into them, even before the Holy Spirit comes, in a lasting and, and uh, perpetual way in, in creation, so that they're ready to meet the call of ministry to which he has called them. Don't forget, he says, I'm, no longer are you going to be fishermen, but now you're going to be fishers of men. And that's about to get real. Despite everything that they have witnessed over the last three plus years in their ministry with Christ, it's about to change because they're going to have to start taking responsibility for this kind of stuff. They're going to actually have to go do something. And like I tell you, the only difference between somebody who does something and somebody who doesn't do something is somebody who does something does something. Some of you are going... Yeah, okay. I got that from Miles McPherson in San Diego a few years ago, but he's absolutely right. Because Jesus has received the Holy Spirit to his disciples. And did you know he, he says the same thing to you and me? Receive the Holy Spirit. You know, he, it, it's, it's, it's the same Christ that these guys are, are walking around with that we worship today. We just sang about him, Right? And so we talk about God the Holy Spirit coming in this context. That's the same God the Holy Spirit that comes to all believers who put their trust in Christ and are born again or saved and indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. They, it's the same Holy Spirit. He's the same God, the Holy Spirit, today as he was 2,000 years ago. As he was eternity ago. And so I want to turn now to... Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And I'm, we're going to look at a few verses here. And this is, this is familiar to many of you. And so in, in chapter 1 of Acts, Jesus tells his disciples to go wait for God the Holy Spirit to come. And, and in verse 4 it says, Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. And he said that he's going to send another helper. Remember what God the Father said to, his, to Jesus' followers? I will send you another helper. And that is the paraclete, the other helper. That's God the Holy Spirit. And he said, so he says, I want you to wait because it's, it's coming. God promised you. Don't forget that he's, not, he's going to keep his promise. 
which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And I, and I kind of love whenever we have discussions about, you know, different denominations and different practices in church and all this kind of stuff. And every once in a while, you know, somebody is a little bit more Pentecostally. Amen. Is that a word, Pentecostally? <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, and so, and they'll, they will, um, they'll say, hey, Pastor, you got a box of snakes back there or anything like that? And uh, I don't really like snakes, so don't have to worry about that. But there's a little bit more of a dependence on, on God the Holy Spirit in certain religious practices versus in others. And quite honestly, in some it doesn't seem like God the Holy Spirit is active at all. But what we do is we celebrate what God the Holy Spirit does. Because you remember in, in, we did a, a series on uh, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. You guys remember that? Anybody want to give me all nine? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. Right? And self-control, yeah, well, we, all, we all get the self-control, okay, good. <laughs> I get it. But we understand that, that God the Holy Spirit man, manifests Himself through the life of a believer, right? There, there ought to be some evidence of Him in our lives. And, and so, you know, and, and what we're going to look at in, in just a moment gives us a, a picture of that, I think. But so what He says is that... Um, it's not for, and that, so they ask him that question that everybody's been asking Jesus, right? And so is, are you, now you're going to take over, right? What, is that what we're waiting for? You're going to overthrow the Romans finally and, and, and take over? And he says, it's not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Amen? And so I know I quote that in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 all the time. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. But there is a specific purpose that Jesus says for which that power is coming. It's not so I can start pulling snakes out of a box and stuff like that. It's not so that we can run around like madmen and barking like dogs and flopping around on the floor and stuff like you might once in a while see on social media. He says, I'm sending you the power of God the Holy Spirit so that you can be my witnesses. And you can do that in Jerusalem, the, the local environment, because they are in Jerusalem, literally, and then and to all Judea. So it includes the Judah and, and Israel and, and, and Samaria, and so the, the broader kingdom and the remotest parts of the earth. And that's, the, that's why I'm going to send you God the Holy Spirit. It's not for you to play with. That power is for a, a specific purpose for us to bear witness to the glory of God and to share the gospel with people that don't yet know Christ as their Savior. That's what that power is for. So the concept of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is, is sometimes kind of a confusing principle for us to kind of understand. And I, I want to see if we can't kind of understand it maybe a little bit more fully. Because if you guys remember in John chapter 3, Jesus meets this guy named Nicodemus who is essentially a Ph.D. in theology. He's a Pharisee, and he comes to Jesus in the middle of the night, and he says, what do I have to do to get to heaven, essentially? What do I have to do to inherit the kingdom of God? And, and what does Jesus tell him? He says, truly, truly, I say to you, in verse 3 of, of John chapter 3, you must be born again. And we just saw P how Peter, uh, in, first, in uh, first Peter chapter 1, he says that we are born again to a living hope, right? And he uses that same language, born again, a new life in Christ. But a couple verses after Jesus tells Nicodemus you have to be born again, he explains it a little bit. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. The new birth, being born of the Spirit. And we've talked about how that tension between the flesh and the Spirit always exists. 
right? As, as long as we are in human flesh, there's always that tension, you know, that, that you know, am I going to walk by the flesh or am I going to walk by the Spirit and how am I going to navigate this life? And, and so it, it, it's a challenge. But what Jesus is telling Nicodemus, I know you've been born of the flesh. And so some people would suggest that the being born of the water means that you uh, have to be baptized. And I don't, I don't think that that's what he's talking about because a few verses later, he refers to being born of the flesh versus being born of heaven. And he kind of contrasts it in that way. Because we are all born of water. Because when a woman is about to give birth, she calls her mother or her husband or her friends or whoever it is, and she says, my water broke, right? Is Kim still here? <laughs> Okay, I just want to make sure. Like, um, but he says you have to be born of the Spirit. And so we, we have to be born of the Spirit. That's what the new birth, being born again, means to be born of the Spirit. And then just a few verses after where, where we are in our text this morning. I'm going to jump ahead actually to, to chapter um, to chapter 2. And verses 2 through 4 we'll put up. Because we all know what happens next. Right? They're, they're waiting in the upper room. And it says, Suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled. Everybody that there was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus had just breathed the Holy Spirit into his apostles, but there's a bunch of other people that are in Jerusalem to celebrate the High Holy Days. And so you remember the rest of the story in that chapter that they start speaking in other languages. And the people that had been gathered, the Jews that had been gathered, Peter is a Jew, when the Jews that had been gathered heard them speaking in their languages, they said, man, there's no way that they could speak our language because they're not, we're not from here. They're speaking our language even though we are foreigners in this land. How could they know our language? But it isn't gibberish. It, they're known languages because they're recognizable by the people that speak those as their native languages. And so what, it, it, in a way, it kind of reflects what it's going to be like in heaven, I think. Because John, in, in, Rome, in, sorry, in uh, Revelation 4 and 5, it, it talks about that a little bit. He says he saw every tongue, every language, and every tribe, like every nationality, every, every uh, family of origin, and, 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 and everybody is worshiping God in their own language. And, but it seems comprehensible. It's, it would sound chaotic to us now if we had everybody speaking a different language in this room. But in the kingdom of heaven, it all comes together to glorify God. And so they're empowered by God, the Holy Spirit. Because don't forget that, that, that Jesus just told them, you're going to be my witnesses even to the remotest parts of the earth, you better be prepared to speak some different languages. Amen? And so by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, they do that, and they witness to the glory of God. And so the last piece that I, that I want to look at is from Acts chapter 2. We're going to turn ahead in Acts chapter 2 uh, and picking up at verse 14. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14. And so this is our guy Peter. And he's the first one to jump up and commence to preach. And are we surprised that Peter's the first one to jump up and start preaching? No. But he's a different guy. And, and we start to see God working through him in some pretty spectacular ways that we're going to end up on this morning. And so God the Holy Spirit empowers him, right? And he starts to, he stands up and he starts preaching. And it says, Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. Pay attention. This is important. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, 
because they're this is this is chaos, right? And they're speaking in all these different languages. And every once in a while, it's it's we talked about this at the membership retreat yesterday too, because every once in a while somebody will try to explain away Jesus drinking wine. You know what I mean? And because they'll say, well, you know, back then, two thousand years ago, the wine was a lot less alcohol content. And like, come on, it was wine, okay? When Jesus converted water into wine, it was wine, okay? It had alcohol in it, and they, you're allowed to drink alcohol, but you're not supposed to be under the influence of alcohol. And that's a really important distinction. But they said, like, come, Peter's going like, these guys aren't drunk. They're, this is, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. This seems nuts to you. I get it. You're trying to come up with some kind of an explanation about how this could possibly happen. And so you say, well, they must be drunk. But it's 9 o'clock in the morning. So it seems not likely. But this is happening in verse uh, 16. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And Joel is the prophet who says, and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men, amen, shall dream dreams. And so this sort of transient nature, if you will, of the activity of God the Holy Spirit in creation that we saw throughout the Old Testament. We see the prophets, Elijah, it says the Spirit came upon them and they prophesied. We see uh, Saul, for example, the Spirit comes upon him and he prophesies. And then it says the Spirit departed him. But Joel the prophet is pointing to, at this point, at the beginning of the church age, the shift from uh, into what we now call the church, the Spirit's going to come and stay. And, and you're going to see some amazing things through the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And so he pointed to that. And we're actually at that point in our text this morning. God did amazing things through Peter. And so, like I said, he, he's a lot different guy. He, he's not chopping off Malchus's ear. He, you know, he's not doing any of that kind of stuff. But God takes that personality, that, that uh, highly driven kind of mentality that he's got, his enthusiasm, his passion in ministry, and he takes him and he says, Peter, start preaching. And he's talking to a Jewish audience here in Jerusalem, the gathering of Jews, right? And so he's, he's pointing to Joel, with whom they would have been familiar. And then a, a little bit later, he even, he even uh, points to uh, something else that they would have been familiar with in, uh, a little bit later in Acts 2, verses 31 and 32. And so he is, he's, he's reached a point of spiritual leadership. I forgot to say that. In Acts chapter, chapter 2, verses 31 and 32, uh, Peter is, um, is talking about King David with whom the Jews in Jerusalem would have been familiar. And he says that he looked ahead, King David looked ahead, and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. And he's quoting Psalm 16, again, with whom the Jews would have been familiar. Because he was only in the tomb three days, amen? And it says, this Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. You remember we talked about that. He was witnesses to the resurrected Christ, right? And Jesus came in and they touched his hands and his side. There are witnesses to the resurrected Christ. And so when he didn't get it, and he says, no, Lord, may it never be. May you never go to the cross. I'll do whatever we have to do to defend you. Now he embraces by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, the cross and glorifies the resurrection. And he points other people to it. Because the Bible tells us that right after this, three thousand people got saved and they were baptized immediately and that's the biblical model that we see somebody comes to faith in christ and they get baptized and and so they, they respond to that and and so it's, they're not getting baptized so they can be saved but there's an apostolic expectation i just love saying that apostolic expectation so there's an apostolic expectation that when somebody comes to faith in christ they will be baptized they will receive god the holy spirit and that's why there's a three-point transformation that happens not just in peter's life as we see he's being called to fulfill the great commission but there's a three-point 
transformation in the life of a believer. Because Peter is called not to be just a fisher man, but to be a fisher of men. To fulfill the Great Commission. Where Jesus says, I want you to go and make disciples and to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The name of names of all three persons of the Godhead. And then to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. But that is not just a command or a commission for Peter. That, that's a command or a commission for us as followers of Christ to go make disciples, to baptize them and to teach them to observe all that Christ has commanded us. And we, we see it kind of played out in, in a way that, that Peter really understands what we're talking about. And so when that whole forgiveness of, of sins thing happens in, in chapter 2, pardon me, uh, I'm going to take a look at verse 37. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37, Peter's been, again, speaking to a Jewish audience, so he's, he, he's referencing King David like we saw in Psalm 16, and, and he's kind of pointing out how the crucifixion happened, and, and he's, he's kind of calling them on that. And it says, when they, when they hear this, and now in verse 37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? What are we going to do? We're, we're guilty in our sins. What are we supposed to do? I just love when somebody says, what are we supposed to do? Because we know what we're supposed to do. And Peter says, repent, all of you, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Repent, it means turn away from our sins and turn to Christ. And so he's, pointing, he's always pointing to Christ. Be baptized. And receive the Holy Spirit. The transformation process by which we each can be transformed. The offer that's been made. What God tells us to do is to put our trust in Christ. Turn from our sins and turn to Him. It's not that complicated. And I get this, sometimes we find, we find ourselves resistant to it because sometimes it might seem too simple or it might mean that I have to give up something. You mean you want me to turn away from the stuff that I've been doing and the stuff that I love? And, and, and the people that I hang out with and the way that I live my life, yeah. It's that simple to understand. Not always that simple for us to embrace. Like they say, the 18 inches between the brain and the heart is the longest 18 inches in the world. And so let today be the day that you turn from your sins and turn to Christ. And we're doing Baptism Sunday on the October the 8th, like I told you at the beginning of the service. And if you have not been baptized as a believer in Christ, the baptism does not forgive your sins, but it is part of the apostolic expectation that when we put our trust in Christ, that we will be baptized in obedience. And don't forget that Jesus said that whoever loves me is the one who keeps my commands. And don't forget, he said, make disciples and baptize them. So he doesn't expect there to be as big separation between the two. And so we come back to our big idea for today, and that's that Peter received the Holy Spirit. And when he did that, his life, his faith, and his ministry were transformed, and he stepped into the role for which Jesus had called him. And so I believe very firmly that God has created each one of us for a purpose. We each have a role in His kingdom. Think about the way that Paul talked about it, that we are each different parts of the body of Christ, and we all serve different roles and purposes in that. We all, all have been given a ministry in some way, but we don't step fully into that until we receive the power of God the Holy Spirit in us, not just so that we can walk around and say, aren't I capable of all things? but that I received the calling and the burden that he's put on my heart. And so we're now what? Uh, this is actually, I kind of ripped this off from the prayer mobilization team document that I shared with you, the vision statement for our denomination just a little while ago. 
And um, that's why it's in quotation marks, but I, I modified it just a little bit. But I'm just saying, ask God to move within our worship services and gatherings in new and fresh ways so that those who attend may recognize and enjoy the presence of God the Holy Spirit in our midst. I just love it when somebody comes into our church and they're, they're like, man, it was just something different. I walked in and I, just, I could sense there was something different about this church. What is it, Pastor? I love when I get easy questions. <laughs> that would be the presence of God the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ. And so I, I, my prayer is that we recognize God for who He truly is and that the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, manifests Himself in us so profoundly that we overflow on to the people around us. Let's pray together. And so, Lord our God, as we have shared together, we're thankful for the gift of God the Holy Spirit. And we're thankful that in our midst we see a manifestation of the fruits of God the Holy Spirit. We see an outpouring of and so, Lord, as we pour out into the lives of others, we pray that you would continue to fill us continually so that we have power in our witness in Royersford and in Limerick Township, in Montgomery and Chester and Berks Counties, 